Across town in Echo Park, locals take pride in their multi-ethnic immigrant community. Outsiders, however, know Echo Park as an area synonymous with crime and corruption. And the last place you'd expect sits a colorful corner lot embedded with the city's rich history. While some see urban blight, others see it as a place of beauty. Well, this site used to be uh, the first, this is the first subway built in Los Angeles in 1925. Um, they stopped using it in 1955. Um, since then, uh, it's been an abandoned lot. And in, over the last 25 years, um, it has become like an outdoor gallery, all the graffiti. This is one of the, the, long, the oldest running and longest and most substantial, um, what do you call it, like a hall of fame for graffiti, uh, definitely for West Coast graffiti. Many people were, were writing here in, 80, in the early 80s. You know, people come from all over the world basically to come to Los Angeles to view the, the street culture. And Los Angeles is known worldwide for that, for that urban street culture, the youth culture. And it's also known as internationally as, a, as one of the greatest places where people make art in general. In my opinion, these artists, these graffiti artists, and graffiti art in general is going to be recognized as one of the most significant movements of the 20th century. There's a community of folks there from all different areas, and they're all there, and you can write there, and there's layers of paint. I have paint from those walls. Um, just, you look at it, and it's like layer upon layer upon layer. There's history painted into those places. You know, this is a very unique space in Los Angeles. There is a confluence of cultures there that you don't find in any other LA location. And it doesn't just have to do with hip hop, it has to do with the Tedasca ball game. There is no other known ball court in the United States, as far as I know, of this game. It is a tremendously vital thing. Interestingly, on the same lot, Another community plays a little-known game called Tarasca. Well, the ancient ball game, first of all, was um, uh, created uh, in uh, about the year 1500 BC. So it's a very, very uh, old uh, organized sport. The ball game uh, was practiced in Mesoamerica, that is the cultural region that goes from north central Mexico to um, El Salvador, approximately. Still several places in Mexico where this game is still played, even though its context, as we will see later, uh, has changed a lot. Uh, the game comes all the way from Mexico, Michoacan, and many people started playing it, like, they would say eight, nine years ago, and they still are playing it to this day. People come from lots of places to come play this. Uh, Susa, Anaheim, Texas, a whole lot of place. The ball is just an ordinary tennis ball, any kind of tennis ball. They shaved it with a, what's that, cheese grater? Cheese grater, and then with this file, they just come and just take the rest off. Stick is, this is called a puño, and so when you're trying to hit the ball, you actually squeeze it hard. They hit it with their hand, just fist, and with this part. Well, the ball game, um, has a mythological connection even uh, before the Aztecs. Two brothers uh, played the ball game against the death gods. They were playing on the surface of the earth and the death gods listened that and they were bothered by those guys that they were playing. So they summoned the, the hero twins as they are called, the, the, the two brothers, and they came to play in the underworld. And uh, they lost against the dead, god, dead gods and they um, were decapitated, they were killed as a punishment. So there is a very strong connection of the ball game with the underworld and with death. And death that produces rebirth. In a nearby neighborhood, graffiti artist Deuce talks about how he got into the graffiti scene. At first, uh, you don't know what you're doing. You know, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just going out there and writing. I, I, I didn't know like the, the true meaning of graffiti, like what it really meant to be a graffiti writer. I, I just kind of winged it. And I think graffiti artists are, are a different breed. We are somewhat hybrids. You know? like, we're not confined to the comforts of our studio. Uh, a lot of us have learned 
to be fast at what we do because most of the time uh, we are doing it out there in the covered darkness, um, illegally. I'm not, I just don't limit myself to thinking like a graffiti artist, but as an artist as a whole, you know, and I, and I try to gather influences from, from different great artists that have existed. One thing I know is that it, it, that it is a group, group activity and, and these artists are self-taught and, and when I mean they're self-taught, they're taught by themselves but they're also taught by their own crew in a sense and, and they have mentors and they have people that they look up to and that teach them tricks of the trade and, and that it, it's passed on you know, from one artist to the next and in an underground way. There's some definitions of graffiti art which essentially say it has to be illegal to be graffiti but that's, that's really not the history of graffiti. And, in my opinion, it, you put it in a, in a context, in a greater context of just public art, freedom of speech at, a, at its greatest. This yard can be considered sort of semi-legal. I mean, it's technically illegal to do, to do pieces here, but it's generally tolerated. It's been tolerated for many, many years. It, occasionally, like this can help preserve the more uplifting, you know, positive aspects of graffiti art and allow us a forum. But writers from all over the world have almost migrated to this, this, this place called the Belmont so they can rock a piece, so they can just say I was at the Belmont and I painted where some of the best writers in LA, some of the best writers in the world have painted before. Like all these yards are gone and they were painted for years, but the one that remained was the Belmont, the original yard is still there. Surface. I could paint any other wall, but the Belmont provided that legitimacy of graffiti history. You know, it was just, it was just something that is uncomparable. Michael Arana, one of the younger Tarasca players, reveals a bit more about the game and its meaning for the community. Right there, we take it as a place where we could go and feel like in Mexico, feel like family, and you know, just get along with everybody. You know, it's a place where you can communicate with your people from over there. I mean, it's it's put my dad, me and my dad closer because I mean, we have more things to to do together. You know. When I play the game, when I'm trying to make a game, I always take him with me, you know? Cause my little brother, my little brother's getting, getting there, you know? I'm already training him. I want him to be one of the youngest players. I just go over there. My time flies by like this over there. Uh, the ball game was probably one of the central elements in that the community identifies very strongly with the ball game. The star players, well, like the star players today, are also heroes within their community. That's what relates it to the games of today. Back at the Belmont Tunnel, a company called Meta Housing recently announced plans to build affordable housing on the site. Um, in February of this year, I read in the downtown news that um, the property had been bought and that there were plans to build this apartment complex. And it's a, they have plans for a 276 unit Complex. The city council members and the area planning commission is worried that if they stop this development, a worse development is going to come in. And recently this year we formed an organization called Belmont Art Park United, which is a coalition of different groups which are interested in trying to save this particular place here where we're at, Belmont, uh, the Belmont Yard, and turn it into a park and a legal graffiti art yard, as well as a cultural historic landmark for Los Angeles. Um, the main thing we're trying to do is to essentially stop this development so that the community that lives here and in the greater Los Angeles community has an opportunity to really study and understand the implications of what would it would happen and what would it would mean to Los Angeles if this place was destroyed. Uh, Despite developers' statements, only 20% of the units will be affordable housing units. The rest? Market rate units inaccessible to most area residents. It's like a regarded statement from them kind of basically taking it away. So I want to put something, my last words. I don't want to go change nothing. Everybody that does everything on the streets is not going to do the same thing. And that's where the whole fight against the Belmont comes in. You know, like we don't want to let go of something. The reality of it is that it means something to us. We try to play in other places, schools, uh, 
in the track, and but they would always kick us out because we they would say we would mess up their field. If this place is gone, then we won't have any other, just other place to play. If the cops in the LA County don't want the Tigers tagging all over their places, why won't they let them go tag right there? I mean, the Tigers go tag, we go play. We ain't, we ain't doing nothing wrong, right? Despite their lack of permit, developers have proceeded with demolition in violation of the law. Basically, you know, they were already working on the floor, and so, you know, my friend got in front, I got in front, so I basically, you know, started, started, started the whole stand, and that's what happened. So I'm like, I'm not gonna let it through, because if we let it through, it would've ran over our bikes too. But also, you know, it would show them that, you know, that we have the power, you know, we're the community and we're working against them, basically showing them that we're not gonna let them do it. And seeing this, what's going on, it basically saddens me, because, you know, not that many people know what's going on here. trying to stop them from doing anything illegally ourselves. They told us we had to leave and the contractors uh, thankfully wrapped it up for today until they get permits. So far, the major thing they, they tore down, uh, an Olmec idol basically, a piece of con uh, sort of a concrete statue about this high that had been painted in the form of a uh, stone Olmec idol. If you look at the spot where it stood, it looks like a scar in the ground. The next day, Demolition resumed. Midway through the illegal demolition, the bulldozer slipped and lodged against the side of the rampway. The ghosts of Belmont have spoken. Right now, it's basically for us, we thought it was too late, but here we are. It's like it's this last minute thing, but you know, it's happening. We're making it, we're making it. It takes you know, a few people to make a move, you know, that movement. So that's basically it. Do what you can, speak out, don't be voiceless. Never thought I could. Never thought I could. But when the 